So, sleep problems in the elderly. And everybody listening knows about sleep deprivation because my hunch is everybody has suffered it. Maybe a night or two, maybe many nights with a small baby or, or someone who's sick or maybe uh, worry about an exam or a business deal. And, and I think what we'd probably say right off the bat is when we don't get good sleep, we just don't feel like our mind is clear. And if that comes to pass not just one or two nights, but night after night after night, I think this uh, little diagram suggests that this then becomes a cascade of problems. I mean, not just that uh, not thinking clearly, as you see in bullet two, cognitive impairment, but irritability, short-tempered, um, you know, our judgment may be a wee bit off. Uh, maybe we're a little more sensitive to things. But uh, as you kind of scan down the list, other things are now, other dominoes are now starting to fall. Our immune system doesn't work as efficiently. Uh, we get heart rate variability, and, and we're beginning to learn that heart rate variability is a predictor of, of lots of disease states and lots of symptoms. And then a bit of a surprise there, it says in terms of our musculoskeletal system, we have increased reaction time. You'd say, oh, you're quicker, faster, more nimble. No, this is more along the lines of a twitch or hypervigilance, not fine motor tuning. In fact, as you can see, decreased accuracy, muscle aches. And then, much more ominously, you know, this is persistent sleep deprivation, growth suppression. You might say, well, I'm grown. I'm an adult. No, uh, throughout our lifespan, you know, we're producing growth hormone, which has a lot to do, human growth hormone, which has a lot to do with cellular repair and the velocity of aging. Um, risk of obesity, decreased temperature, and that's just with sleep deprivation. So back in the 1970s, it was popular for just a, a sunspot of time for radio disc jockeys. They'd have a fundraising, and they'd try to stay up as long as they could. 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, and um, right around 48 to 72 hours, they began to actively hallucinate and essentially looked and felt psychotic. So, you know, that's kind of at the far end behaviorally of the effects of sleep deprivation. So we know that um, not getting regular refreshing sleep can have all sorts, a real spectrum of uh, of symptoms and all sorts of problems for us mere mortals. So I love to ask medical students, psychiatry residents, even fellow doctors, the simplest of, of questions, but you know, we all know that the simplest of questions is often the hardest of questions. So I'll say, what are the functions, plural, of sleep? And usually just putting the plural on it kind of stuns most people. So medical students will often give me the kind of deer in headlights and they'll say, well, the, the function of sleep is, to, is to, to rest. Of course, you say, well, well, could we actually make that into a sentence perhaps instead of just a single word? But it's just so elegant, so ingenious, so brilliant what the creator uh, has designed for us mere mortals with sleep because it's not simply to rest. Number one, as you can see, it's energy conservation. So, you know, if you think of ourselves for just a minute as a machine, it's generally not good for machines to continuously run. And, and going back to the disc jockeys that are not getting any sleep after a while, energy conserva conservation really wears thin and, and bad things happen. But wait, there's more. And, and this is, oh, by the way, all these pieces are, are now evidence-based and documented. We know that when we intentionally sleep deprive college students, after two or three days, we can look at their immune system and see that it's beginning to tumble and that they're much more likely to uh, acquire viral illness or bacterial illness. So somehow, some way, magically, mysteriously, during sleep, our immune system reboots. But wait, there is more. This is like an infomercial. When we sleep, and this is easily measured, lots of evidence, there's hormonal restoration. So this is when our body reboots hormonally, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, human growth hormone 
which again to reinforce has a lot to do with cellular aging and cellular repair. So if that's damaged or slowed down, we're going to see cellular repair um, diminished and cellular aging accelerated. And then the last one, very or not the fourth bullet I should say, very near and dear to my heart as a, as a psychiatrist is memory consolidation. So every day we have billions, maybe trillions uh, of bits of information coming our way. The vast majority is noise and we have to kind of sort out what's important, what do we want to keep in short-term storage, long-term storage, uh, what, what will help us survive. And there's, again, good evidence, you know, taking college students and sleep depriving them and asking them to do memory functions. We just see them perform awful. So we think sleep has a lot to do with memory consolidation. But the most exciting thing, absolutely the most exciting thing, and this is very new, as you can see, science 2013. So we know about the lymphatic system in our body. It's from the neck down. And what the lymphatic system does is it sort of parallels blood vessels and veins, and it removes waste products. Brilliant. Quite fascinating. There are no, there's no lymphatic system in our brain, this enclosed capsule that weighs three pounds and takes up 25% of the energy requirements of our body every second of the day. So uh, this very recent finding that in our brain there's something called a glymphatic system. And the short story is this is actually built into the cerebral spinal fluid and during the day when we're awake the CSF is relatively inactive, relatively slow moving. But at night when we sleep the CSF switches over into a far faster paced, far uh, broader spectrum of coverage and we think that that is the built-in lymphatic system, if you will, of our brain. But wait, there's more. There's now evidence that the glymphatic system perhaps has a lot to do with clearance of beta amyloid plaque production. So one of the potential targets in terms of Alzheimer's research is, is there any way to perhaps amplify this glymphatic system that appears as we age to be less robust? So this is a new finding, stay tuned, but uh, exciting finding that here's a clearance system for waste products in the brain that may actually have some benefit in terms of dementia. And then the last little bullet, there's a, a movement afoot, mostly from uh, the folks that study sleep. As, as sleep deserves to be studied, we spend a third of our life in it. And when I went to medical school, in my four years of medical school, we got one hour on sleep. And I think I got 70 hours on the Krebs cycle, and I'm waiting to use the Krebs cycle any day now where I always ask all my patients about sleep. So back on track, there's a movement afoot now driven by sleep specialists that maybe sleep should be the fifth vital sign or certainly should be a very early part of inquiry on any exam. You know, uh, how well do you sleep? What time do you go to sleep? What time do you wake up? Is it restful? Is it restorative? So we'll see what, what time will tell, but I, I hope I'm highlighting the, the uh, incredible importance and the multiple functions of sleep that we don't really consider until we start to think about it. So a bit about physiology. So this is a, the wake-sleep circuit, and this circuit is mutually inhibitory, mutually inhibitory. That is to say, when our wake promoting system is active, which you can see on the left side of the screen from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., our sleep promoting system is now decaying, okay? And then, you know, and it's driven primarily by light, also by temperature, we're mammals after all. Um, and then you can see starting around 6 p.m. our sleep promoting system starts to dim like a dimmer switch and our I'm sorry, a wake-promoting system starts to dim, and our sleep-promoting system starts to come online. So it's mutually inhibitory, and this is a, really about a 23.8-hour cycle. So 
the circadian rhythm, if you will, Latin circa around the day. So uh, we'll take it a little bit further. This is the arousal promoting system in our brain, and I'm sorry I couldn't flip this around. So uh, on your left hand, I'm sorry, your right hand side looking at this is the frontal lobes, and on your left hand side is the cerebellum. And this wakefulness and arousal promoting system is actually pretty well mapped out. It, that's the circuitry that you see there. Those are the, the brain regions. And we're pretty sure it's uh, modulated by a number of neurotransmitters. Uh, the usual culprits, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, all those are less so. But we now have uh, really abundant and emerging evidence that there's another neurotransmitter called orexin. Uh, it was initially investigated because we thought it played a big part in appetite. And lo and behold, we discovered that orexin, this orexin neurotransmitter plays an enormous part in wakefulness. So again, uh, you know, with light, this wake-promoting system is quote-unquote activated, and with darkness, it starts to um, diminish. So that's the arousal-promoting system. It's as if in our brain we have uh, two clocks, if you will, going on. So that takes us to the sleep promoting system. Again, this is very well mapped out. Uh, kind of the center of activity is what's called the VLPO, the VILPO, the ventral lateral preoptic area. And there's the circuitry there and a number of neurotransmitters, uh, dopamine again, but uh, norepinephrine again and serotonin again, they play very minuscule parts. But really, this system is kind of driven by GABA, that's a neurotransmitter, another neurotransmitter called galanin, and then, believe it or not, histamine. Histamine plays a big part in the sleep-promoting system. So as darkness falls, and, and I, I think melatonin should be in there, but unfortunately, I don't see it. So another neurotransmitter, as darkness falls, we see more melatonin secreted. We think that plays a part in sleep induction and sleep maintenance. So. Last piece of physiology. Um, so this is a, a little sleep histogram from birth to death. And uh, it's a lot to digest, um, but uh, essentially in the green is the amount of time we spend in wakefulness as we age. And then in the red, the amount of time we spend in REM sleep, again, as we age. and then the amount of time we spend in non-REM sleep, and I'll explain that in just a minute, but if you kind of follow this out, since we're talking about sleep problems in the elderly, right away it becomes abundantly clear that as uh, we fall into that last third of our life, spend a lot of time awake, not quite so much time in non-REM sleep, and REM sleep is really starting to kind of vanish, okay, kind of vanish. Of course, if we take it to the other end of the spectrum, you know, we know that Babies sleep a lot, and when they sleep, they're doing a lot of REM sleeping, rapid eye movement. Of course, that's a, another very mysterious triangle of physiology. What is it? What are dreams? Uh, how do they come about? What's the importance of it? So what we know is that normal aging sleep, as all of us age, some very clear events happen. Number one, our sleep efficiency goes down. You say, what the heck sleep efficiency? Sleep efficiency is simply the amount of time that we're asleep divided by the amount of time we're in bed. So my wife will tell you that my sleep efficiency, much to her dismay, is 100%. As soon as my head hits the pillow, bang, I'm out until I wake up. It, it, it disturbs her to no end. She's exceedingly jealous, okay? So, so normal aging sleep, Decreased sleep efficiency. Increased fragmentation. Um, uh, so fragmentation means we fall asleep, we stay asleep. So fragmentation means we wake up, wake up, and this isn't just to go to the bathroom and then come back and fall asleep quickly. We wake up or we don't have, we don't go through the stages of sleep, which I'll show you in just a bit. So the third bullet makes sense. If we're less efficient and if our sleep is fragmented, total sleep time falls off. 
And, you know, you can kind of see that here. I mean, if we add REM and non-REM as we age from, uh, let's say, age 20 to age 60, there's a significant decrement. So, and then lastly, increased daytime sleep, and you can see that in the green emerging. So that's normal aging sleep. Doesn't mean it's pathologic. That's sleep over our lifespan. So, just a wee bit more. Sleep stage distributions change, and you say, what the heck is that? And I'm, I keep tantalizing you. That's the next slide. But what we see with sleep stage distributions is we see less slow wave sleep. Why is that important? Because we think slow wave sleep is where we see hormonal restoration, immunal fun immune function being rebooted, memory consolidation. So if we have less of that, those functions we have less of. Decreased REM, and again, that's a little bit more of a mystery. We're not quite sure. There's a lot of hunches, but nothing solid. And increased stage one and stage two sleep. And you say, well, why is that a problem? Because stage one and stage two are actually very light stages of sleep. So here's, here's a, this is a polysomnograph. I can only say that once a day. If uh, you or someone you know should uh, be recommended to have a sleep study, they'll go to a laboratory, uh, hotel bed, very nice bedroom, and uh, they'll be wired up. They'll have a 20 lead EEG on their head. They'll have electrodes on their eyelids so we can measure rapid eye movement. They'll have a pulse oximeter up here. They'll have a band around their chest to measure volume. They'll have an EKG on. They'll have a band on their leg to measure, measure muscle tension. It's a little bit like the mechanical man. And then they're asked to go to sleep. And as one sleeps, what we see are stages of sleep. And actually, this is a, a marvelous tool, a tremendous instrument, because uh, we have parameters about what are normal stages of sleep and what are abnormal stages of sleep. And it allows sleep doctors, sleep medicine specialists, to, to make diagnoses. But roughly, this is what it looks like. This is kind of the short story. So we fall asleep, and we usually have, when we fall asleep, there's a really quick, very quick period of REM. And then it, it's, it's a bit like a, a roller coaster. We go through stage one sleep, which is very light, easily disturbed, stage two a bit deeper, and then stage three and four. That's slow wave sleep, stage three and four, okay? And then we kind of pop back out two, one, REM again, then back down again. This is a, a cycle over the night. So usually we have four cycles. Each cycle is on order 90 to 120 minutes. And that's staging of sleep. So when we're in a sleep lab, we can look at each of these stages, what's, how much stage one, stage two, stage three, and REM, and what we have reference ranges, what's too little, what's too much. So it's a great, a great pickup. And what we know, again, to backpedal, as we age, okay, we see less slow wave sleep, less REM, and increased stage one and two, which aren't particularly restorative. So... That's physiology, okay? In conclusion, the words you're longing to hear, when uh, the elderly suffer from insomnia, and for purposes of time, we're just going to zero in on insomnia in the elderly from here on out because that's the most common uh, diagnosis. A and I'm also hoping to be invited back for parts two, three, and four, like REM disorder sleep and uh, dementia and uh, disorders of sleep and Alzheimer's disease, but in the elderly, in a general way, what we see is as we age, there's disruptions in the circadian, around the clock, sleep-wake pathways. Um, there's some emerging evidence that insomnia, which we've always thought for about 2,000 years, is a problem in the sleep promoter not working efficiently. Now we're getting some evidence that maybe the sleep promoter is working just fine, but perhaps the wakefulness promoter isn't turning off. So insomnia, strangely enough, may be a disorder of excessive wakefulness. And I'll explain that in just, well, actually the, the third bullet kind of explains that. There's some evidence that there's increased levels of orexin. Remember that neurotransmitter in the wake promoter? in the cerebral spinal fluid of Alzheimer's patients, and maybe that's why they have sleep deterioration. So more to come. This is an early piece.